Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Devon and Cornwall branch April Technical Evening, hosted by Adam Matthews, exploration geologist at Cornish Lithium. It's fantastic to see a resurgence in uh, Cornish mining prospects over recent years, and especially in a mineral that is key to reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. So I'll hand over to Adam to give us an overview of this exciting project. Hi, guys. So I'm exploration or project geologist at Cornish Lithium. My role is mainly focusing on the shallow geothermal water exploration at Cornish Lithium. But we have numerous strands within the company, and I'll explain some of those later on. What my presentation will mainly focus on is the exploration of shallow geothermal waters and why we're actually exploring for them. So this is the most entertaining slide. You know, the world now is getting more aware of uh, global warming, increased carbon in the atmosphere, all that kind of, of thing. So why will a low carbon future actually be more intensive on, on minerals? And that's kind of the first point in this presentation. So to allow for this clean energy transition, so you know, electric vehicles or renewable energy, you actually we naturally need to obtain more minerals than we have previously, or different minerals than we have previously. So there's some examples along the bottom. For renewable energy, you need wind and solar, and then to store that energy, that'll be in batteries. So when it's windy, you'll generate electricity, but that needs to be stored in batteries for when it's not windy or it's not sunny for us to use and obviously batteries are also used in electric vehicles as well so for wind for example within the next few years the capacity for wind is going to increase percent three percent small wind turbines or like these large wind turbines which are now being produced can be 15 megawatt wind turbines and that singular wind turbine could be enough to be able to provide the power for a small town so these technologies are advancing pretty pretty quickly, but to actually produce them, we need to obtain so much more sort of metal. So here, for example, we need for one singular wind turbine, for three megawatt wind turbine, sorry, you need 4.7 tonnes of copper, 385 tonnes of steel, and also 1,200 tonnes of concrete. And also you've got two tonnes of rare metals in there and three tonnes of aluminium. So you can see just for one wind turbine, you've got so much um, demand on, on metals. Same can be said for solar. That's obviously been a very fast advancing technology in the last few years. But you can see most of it is glass, polymer, but there is aluminium in there, 7% of it. There's also 1% copper and some silver, tin, and lead in there. And that silver, you know, less than 1% of the solar panel is made from silver, but actually making a solar panel accounts for 7% of global silver demand. So Again, it's quite a big drain on the resources. So people need to start finding these resources to be able to meet this new wave of technology and the demand that it's putting on it. So this could, you know, all this new energy can be stored within batteries. There's three points to a battery. There's the anode, which is made of graphite, the electrolyte, which is lithium salts, and then uh, the cathode, which has many different elements within it. Obviously, we're Cornish lithium, so we're mainly looking at finding lithium, which can be used for these the electrolyte solutions, so lithium salts. So if we look at the demand for these metals predicted over the next 30 to 40 years, you can see that lithium has a, about a 1,000% increase in demand from the current day to about 20 or 30 years' time. Cobalt, over 500% increase. And graphite, indium, vanadium, and nickel all have over 100% increases in the, de the demand. And then silver, neodymium, molybdenum, aluminium, copper, and manganese also have increased demands. So if you look at copper there, it looks quite a small increase in how much we need, only 7%. But you can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, in the last 5,000 years, it's been about 550 million tonnes of copper has been mined. But it's predicted that we will need that amount within the next 25 years. So the amount that we've mined in 5,000 years, we would only need in 25 years. So again, we're looking at that ever-increasing demand for these, these metals. So why, why is lithium in the UK important? So electric vehicles on the road is predicted, well, the government wants all newer vehicles on the road to be electric by 2030. So that means you know, diesel and petrol cars can remain on the road but the new vehicles by that date have to be electric vehicles. So obviously that's, that's very important. And 
that industry is thought to be worth 4.8 billion. And obviously, because of that demand, the the need on lithium is going to increase by 965%, as we saw on the last slide. So thinking about that, there isn't any active uh, mining or supply of lithium extraction in Europe at all. And UK currently imports all of its, nearly all of its raw materials, including lithium. So what Cornish Lithium are looking to do is provide the UK with a domestic supply of lithium so that when we're going into this, you know, this new new, new age, we can produce the electric vehicles ourselves. We could be self-sufficient with, uh, with this demand. So Cornish Lithium as a company, we've got four main major focuses. We've got shallow lithium and rich lithium waters. So that's lithium hosted within the water itself. We've also got deep geothermal waters. So both of those are effectively um, the same target, the same resource, but the capital expenditure for both of them is are significantly different. So when you're looking at shallow hole, the borehole is going to be about one to two kilometers deep, and it's going to cost you about one million pounds to drill that borehole. Whereas deep geothermal waters, you're looking at four and a half to five and a half kilometers, and then you're looking at tens to hundreds of millions of pounds to drill one borehole. So the companies separated the two projects, even though it's looking at the same thing due to the capital expenditure. The company also look, is looking for um, lithium in hard rock. We've got a hard rock lithium project within um, the St. Austell area in Cornwall. And what that project's looking at is that the granites in Cornwall are extremely rich in lithium in some areas. Some of them are, well, well that lithium is within a mica called zimaldite. So Cornish Lithium are also looking at exploring for lithium in hard rock. And then obviously Cornwall is a, a major or was a major mining district for tin and copper. Obviously, there are still a few mines in Cornwall as well, mainly exploring for new prospects now. But with our all the drilling that we're doing and the geothermal waters, for example, being hosted within historic structures or historic copper structures that were mined, we're always going to be finding these new structures for tin and copper as well. So obviously we're going to have an interest in that. As I'm project geologist of the shallow geothermal waters, most of this presentation will focus on the work that we've done there, but I may allude to some of these other projects as well. So Cornish Lithium started um, in 2016. This, this section here is from the 1800s, and you can see that in the bottom right there, that the, the people at the time had written that the temperature in the loads or the levels of the mine are about 230 fathoms, which equates to about 450 meters in present day terms, or 124 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's 51 degrees Celsius. So that's obviously extremely hot for just, just over 400 meters. It's geothermal gradient of about 100 degrees C per kilometer. And it also mentions that that hot water is issuing in great quantities is rich in lithia, and lithia is, is lithium. So in the 1800s, they had identified that. Um, lithium was in these waters, but at the time, you know, they'd only just discovered lithium as an element itself back then, so they didn't really have a use for it. So in 2016, when the company started, this is what they're really looking at. It had this resurgence of, well, need for electric vehicles and renewable energy, and the need for lithium because of batteries. So the company decided to start looking at these mining records to identify if we could. Um, actually extract the lithium from these waters. So we came up with a, a geological concept that these fluids or geothermal waters are convecting along permeable structures. So there might be faults, it might be joints, but they need to be permeable, obviously, because metasediment, which is one of the main rocks in Cornwall, and granite, which is the other, both aren't particularly permeable. So we need permeable structures to allow for the fluids to flow. And because, because of that geothermal gradient, we knew that, or the heat of the fluids, we knew that the water was coming from depth. So they were probably convecting. And we came up with the concept that we could drill beneath where this, the observations in the historic mines were, down dip of the structures, and isolate those structures and pump that water to surface, sample it, and then we could at least see if it was enriched in lithium, and then go further to see if, if that could be commercially viable as well. So 
that first historic map that I showed you was a mine called United Mines, which shut in the late 1800s. And that was our first drill site because it had a lot of mining data. So we could easily work out where the, the faults were. And it also had a lot of observations. I think it had over 30 or 40 observations of geothermal waters in flowing into the mine. So it was a relatively confident area for us to prove this concept. So we drilled two boreholes um, underneath that mine into that structure, cored the full way in HQ three diameter, which is 96 millimeters. And our target was a structure historically known as hot load and surprise, surprise, hot load. The reason it was called that was because of it had all these geothermal waters, which was inundated the miners whilst they were mining it. And the entire aim of the project was just to be able to intercept a permeable structure, whether it's hot load or another one, and extract lithium into rich geothermal waters to prove that this concept that we had developed from historic records was correct. So whilst we um, did the drilling, we collected information about the chemistry of the water, the hydrogeology. We also did wildland geophysics of both boreholes, and we did some core scanning with another company after we had um, extracted the core to get some uh, further information about the permeability of the structures. And I'll show you some of that data later on. So what does one of those permeable structures look like? Well, this is hot load within um, hole two. You can see in the top left, about 639 meters, we get a few quartz chlorite veins with some chalcopyrite and pyrite. So that's classic copper mineralization in Cornwall. Then just at 640 meters, the drillers have wrote total fluid loss on the core box, meaning that the drill muds never reach the surface. And that's because of the permeability of the structure. And we can see over two meters of massive sulfide, mainly chlorite matrix with chalcopyrite, chalcosite, and uh, pyrite being the main sulfide minerals, which is obviously really interesting for a copper mine perspective, but for the lithium you can see how vuggy the structure is. There's vugs all the way through it. There's vertical fractures, very open, very permeable. So when we saw this, we were, we were very excited. What we did next um, was to isolate that. And I'll, I'll show you how we did that later on in the presentation. This here is the geophysics, some of the geophysics data. What you can see where those vertical bands are, are a piece of geophysics called televiewer data. And effectively, it's an image well, an unwrapped 360 degree image of the borehole. So each of this strip is a, just a different processed image, but the sinusoidal wave is a joint within the rock. And uh, the bottom part of the sinusoidal wave here is the, we, we can align that to the dip direction. And then the amplitude of that wave is the dip of, this, of that joint or structure. So we can, we've got that for the whole length of the hole. So we know the orientation and dip of every single structure within the hole, which is going to be really useful for making a resource later. But also what you can see is there's on the left is the dark band, but on the, on the right is red bands on the sinusoidal wave. And that is kind of the aperture of that joint. So the one there says 20 centimeter open vein. That literally is something which is 20 centimeters wide void space. And because of its sinusoidal curve, we know that it's structurally controlled. So if you imagine 20 centimeter void, how much water can be flowing through that? So that's just showing how permeable these structures are. Then we look at the bottom and we've got a two meter void. So it's even greater permeability down there. And this is this kind of data is really, really key for us because obviously where these void spaces are, we don't actually get any core because there wasn't anything there in the first place. We just know that there's core loss. So we can actually quantify that and actually give structural information to those void spaces. Um, the discs on the right, you can see here, these are the shape of the borehole. So the second annulus is the natural shape of the borehole. So the red at the, on the bottom two is showing increased width of the borehole due to collapse or due to the void space. And then the tadpole plot to the right is just the dip and dip direction. And then we've got the cor corresponding core images right on the right hand side of the slide. So this is some of that core scanning data we're telling you about. The right, the video on the right is um, is a CAT scan image. So what some of the things that we did was we put this 
interval or permeable interval into a CAT scan. And then we can quantify the shape of the void space. So the black and white images you can see on the left, the circular one is a slice horizontal through the core. And then the two vertical ones are orthog orthogonal views. So the dark is void space and the lighter color is sulfides. And then the kind of the moderate gray is just the, the sediment itself. So we can really start to see those geometry of that void space and also start to quantify this permeability as well, which again is going to be really good for our resource in the future and actually understanding how this water is flowing through these structures. So how did we actually sample these structures and get an uncontaminated sample from over 600 meters depth? So there was two, two methods. The first one that we employed was we would drill. Once we hit a permeable structure, like the core I previously showed you a few slides ago, we knew, know that it's probably going to be permeable. We would make the drillers drill through until we were happy that we were through the entire width of the structure. And the drillers would pull back to above the structure with the drill rods and we would lower down what's called a packer, which essentially is a balloon that you can inflate. And we inflate that incompetent rock above the structure, which then isolates it hydrogeologically from anything else intercepted by the borehole. We could then, um, that then connects to the rods and the rods act like a straw into that interval. We can then lower a pump. We lowered the pump, a submersible pump to about hundred meters. And then we were able to pump just from that interval itself and be able to obtain uncontaminated sample from that interval. So that was how we tested most intervals. But then at the end, well, what I should say first is once we had finished sampling the interval, we could then continue drilling until we found another interval. And then we'd, we'd repeat that method. What we did at the end was we put a pack a much shallower depths, and then we could sample from multiple structures simultane simultaneously. And that allowed us to more simulate real production or commercial conditions. And we could see if the chemistry at all changed or anything like that and start to understand the hydrogeology of, of a bigger system. So here's some PowerPoint skills I've tried to illustrate this. So the green is the ground level, blue is the water table, and the red are the faults that we're trying to target. So just to reiterate that, what we do is we drill through the structure. We can then put in a packer, and then you fill the packer with water until it reaches 800 PSI, where a valve will switch and allow the packer to remain open. Whilst you do that, as you can see by the schematic, the water level in the borehole obviously goes all the way to the top because you're pumping water down. And then it will recover to a certain depth. And that depth, in most cases, was actually higher than the water table itself. And the reason for that, as you can see with the graphs on the left, is due to um, the hydraulic gradient. So the hydraulic gradient being higher in that structure because of the upwelling fluid, we can then quantify the pressure at which it's upwelling. So maximum was 80 meters and the minimum was about 71. So our hydraulic gradient is about plus nine meters in what in our most upwelling structure, which is quite significant. We then lower down the pump, we would pump, and then we'd get a drawdown whilst we pump the water. And that drawdown allows us to understand the permeability of the structure because we know how much water we're pumping at what rate and what drawdown. And there's hydrological equations which allow you to calculate the permeability based on that. And then again, we do the same process again with the deep structure. We can isolate that away from the other one and collect the same data. We also had a transducer within the packer so we could record the temperature and pressure during pumping. So the graph on the left, what you can see is the temperature rapidly increases when you initially turn the pump on. And that's probably because we're getting rid of all the drill muds that we had pumped into the structure whilst we're drilling. And then it starts to level off. And at about 7 p.m. just before, there's a decrease in temperature. And that's because we would have turned the pump off at the end of a shift. It then stabilized throughout the night. And then as we turn the pump on again in the morning, 7 a.m. the next morning, temperature then increases again. So this is showing to us that whilst we're pumping, we are drawing up water from depth. Therefore, it's getting hotter which is really good for us. We're not means that we're actually getting deeper water rather than drawing in water from above or from the sides, 
which is much less likely to have higher levels of lithium. The higher concentration of lithium will come from depth. And you can see encircled in red are blue points. And that is when we took a water sample at surface, we know how long it took for the water to come up uh, the drill pipe. So we can back calculate the time it took to leave that interval. So we can assess how stable the conditions may have been when we take, took that sample. So looking at the chemistry, this is the historic data because we haven't released the actual chemistry of our results yet. Essentially, it's, it lies on this trend. What we can see is on the left, we've got lithium versus total dissolved solids. And we've got an R squared value of that graph from about 0.9. So that's a really good correlation. So the higher the total dissolved solids in the solution, the higher the lithium concentration. And on the right, we've got a correlation between lithium and then the depth. So the deeper we get, the higher the concentration of lithium we get. And that's quite an obvious trend when you start to think about it because the deeper you get, the hotter it gets. And then within chemistry, the hotter something is, usually the more it dissolves. So if it dissolves more, the totals of solids are higher, therefore the lithium is higher. So it's kind of a bit of a circle, but you know we've got our shallow and our deep projects. So I'm trying to find that, that balance between what's the most economic depth to drill to to get the most cost-effective lithium grade. And we can also classify our waters in this Turner diagram. Anything in the bottom right-hand corner of that tin diagram will be an immature water, just stream water or rainwater. If it's on the bottom left, it's going to be, we know that we'll be sampling acid mine drainage. So probably something coming from the historic mine workings because of the high sulfur content. But then anything at the top, we know that is a geothermal water because of the high chlorine content and the geothermal waters are enriched in chlorine as well. So then we just know that we're sampling the um, mature waters or geothermal waters when we're in that zone. So I talked about the, the deep geothermal project. We have released the results of that. And it was about 250 to 260 milligrams per litre lithium. And the graph on the left compares that to other data sets worldwide. So the deep geothermal chemistry is the, the red dot there indicated by UDDGP. So it's higher concentration of lithium than any other recorded geothermal brine in the world. It's also higher than oil field brines, but you can see that it's less than uh, salar brines. Salar brines are usually seen in Atacama and places like that, where they use solar evaporation to concentrate the brines. So obviously it's a completely diff different system. So what we're really pleased with is that the lithium concentration of the geothermal waters is the highest in that borehole than anything other, anything else which is published worldwide. We can also see that the total dissolved solids of that data point is significantly lower than, than anything else. When we show that to processing engineers, things like that, they're really excited by because there's much less of anything else to get out of this the water. So if you've got 250 totals, grams per litre total of solids, you've got a lot of things to get out of the water. Whereas when you're less than 50 grams per litre like we are, there's much less other things other than lithium to get out of the water. So it makes it much easier to process. So it's a deep geothermal example, but it can be used for the shallow as well of how we might extract the lithium that we found within the water. So we could pump up this water like we have during the exploration which could go into a geothermal power plant, create electricity, which could power homes. Could also The heat could also be used for heating the homes or horticulture, like big farms or greenhouses, like generating the heat for that. And then that water can then be put through the, the lithium pilot plant or process plant to create a lithium concentrate that can then be used for uh, the battery industry, either for electrical vehicles or geothermal energy. And that spent water could then perhaps be put back down to depth to, to regain lithium um, by further dissolving the granite. And then, then the process continues. So usually the processing to get the lithium out of the water would be you'd pump up the lithium brine. This is in a salar example. Then they'd use solar evaporation to then concentrate that lithium into a brine because lithium prefers being in solution. So it's the last thing to evaporate. So that last bit of fluid, which is enriched in lithium, they can put that through 
a concentrating process plant, which would then create a lithium carbonate to be shipped for producing into batteries. So what that looks like is something like this. We've got over five kilometers worth of evaporation ponds, different colors at different stages of the evaporation. But obviously, it's a massive impact on um, the environment and footprint. On Obviously, solar evaporation, you can't really do in, in Cornwall. It rains too much uh, as well. So that's not going to be viable for us either. So there's new technologies coming on board now, which are called direct lithium extraction technologies. There's a few that are um, slightly different technologies, but they're all you know, they all seem to be working. And a few of those are on the right that we're working with, Lilac, Geo40, Adionics, and Precision Periodic. This is one of the examples of their processing technique. So we can put the lithium-rich water through a column, which is full of beads, which attract lithium ionically. So when the water passes through it, the lithium gets taken into the bead structure and then the lithium depleted water would then come out through the bottom and then could be taken away for maybe the heating schemes or being put back into the ground or processed further to get other elements out. And then st stage two is that you'd use uh, a desorbent fluid to so something that can unattract the lithium from the beads. So that's passed through the columns. And then you'd, at the end, you'd get a lithium concentrated fluid, which would, would essentially just be tap water with lithium. So it's much less totals or solids than the fluid that went into the, the processing. And then that concentrated brine can just be made into a carbonate and then gone into electrical vehicles and, and things like that. In terms of carbon intensity, obviously, we've got hard rock mining, which is partly what we're we're looking to do with our, our hard rock projects, but also what is the main source of lithium at the moment. So hard rock spodumene deposits in Australia and places like that. The carbon intensity for that is extremely high because they have to crush the rocks, they have to grind the rocks to liberate the, the minerals, and then they go on to further process those minerals. So one of the most intensive things worldwide, just in general, is crushing rocks. So you can see that that carbon intensity is extremely high for that. Salar brines, which is with those massive evaporation ponds, they have quite low carbon intensity relatively, but still they have a carbon intensity because they're not actually generating any renewable energy or offsetting their carbon. But for the geothermal brines, and there's another company looking at doing something similar to us in the Rheingraben, which is called Vulcan Energy. And they've predicted that they can offset their carbon emissions up to minus five to minus seven tons of CO2 because they can generate electricity to power their processing plant at the same time as actually extracting lithium, creating the energy, doing regional heating schemes, all of that stuff that I've described. So what are we doing going forward? So Cornish Lithium, which at the bottom there, we continue to research the development of the geothermal water system. So we, we're developing that, that drill site that we, we drilled last year and looking to have some test plans and evaluate how we can test, test that fluid, how we can extract the lithium from it. But we're also continuing to look for new sites as well. There's lots of other opportunities for geothermal waters across Cornwall that we've seen, again, also in the historic mining archives. So we'll be also looking to drill boreholes in the future as well. But Cornish Lithium has also created a subsidiary in the last few months called GeoCubed. And that company is working in collaboration with Geothermal Engineering Limited, which is a company that drilled the deep geothermal hole that, that we sampled and I talked about earlier. And that's been funded by the government through the Getting Building Fund. And we're looking to uh, build a lithium pilot plant on that geothermal well within the next 12 to 18 months. And it's currently hiring um, a team of 10 people. I think we've got five already, but that's to start building that pilot plant. So that's kind of going to the next stage, the step for production there as well. So it's all, all going forward at, at ever increasing speed. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really exciting. So thanks for listening. Does anyone have any questions? I don't want Adam. What's the sort of rough kind of reserves, resource estimate in terms of the quantity of lithium that could be, uh, could either be in Cornwall or in the UK? Yeah, good question. I think a hard one to quantify fully. We've obviously got the hard rock deposits and the geothermal brine deposits. 
with the hard rock, we see that I know our particular project, they are creating a resource at the moment. I don't know exactly which, like the size of that resource. Um, I'm not working directly on that project, but I do know that where it's deple- the lithium is depleted in that project is where there's permeable structures and we've leached that lithium into the waters and that's what the geothermal is targeting. So we can actually try and almost scavenge all of the lithium that is available. Um, in t- terms of the geothermal side, we're working closely with SRK um, as consultants to understand how we can generate a resource and a quantity for geothermal fluids because this kind of resource has never been made before. Um, everything's usually hard rock because either copper and it's there in, in situ or it's tin and it's there in situ. Whereas water, obviously, it flows. It's got a, it's almost got a fourth dimension to it because it's in the structure, it flows, and it's got chemistry. Um, so we're working closely with them how to actually be able to quantify it in a reportable way. Um, what it's looking like at the moment is actually how quickly it recharges um, versus how fast you can pump. And that's probably the best way to be able to quantify it. Um, so, yeah, no no numbers yet, but we're, we're working on that closely with SRK. Adam, uh, Martin Isles, could I ask you a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, my, it's a long time since I uh, l- uh, remember any geology, but um, uh, we're talking about the Variscan orogeny, are we not, down yes. for southwest? Uh, are there other parts of the world where the Variscan orogeny uh, situation could lead to similar um, enrichment of lithium? And, and um, if so, are you, you know, are you planning to look at those? Yeah, of course. Um, so the main cause of the lithium in Cornwall is these lithium-rich granites. Um, they were identified by the USA or the USGS, uh, the United mm-hmm. States Geological Survey, that yeah. um, they were incredibly enriched. I'm not sure if that was caused by the Variscan, but it's definitely due to the, the formation of the granites in Cornwall and the fractional crystallization that occurred here. Um, I do know that in terms of geothermal waters, there are other places in the UK that have seen enrichments. And for example, obviously the Rhine Graben, which where Vulcan Energy is working, also has uh, lithium enrichments within their geothermal fluids as well. So it definitely is, um, you know, it's a new thing finding looking for elements within waters and it's creeping up more and more now people are aware of it um so yeah i think watch this space but uh cornish lithium is mainly focusing on cornwall but obviously it's had it recently had the um lithium for uk funding from the government which we looked at all of the uk and the potential for lithium extraction concluding that cornwall was mainly the the best place but there was definitely other places in the uk that could have potential as well. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's been a question just posted on the uh, on the on the on the chat um, okay. or a couple on there. Um, so from uh, David Brook, uh, I always understood that the geothermal energy prospects in Cornwall were from hot, dry rock with water injected into the deep granite and recovered after flowing through hydro fractures generated by the project. The use of existing waters is new to me. So yeah, so with that point, um, yeah, back in the eighties, there was uh, the Hot Dry Rocks project in Cornwall, uh, which kind of pioneered geothermal energy um, across the world, and people are still doing using the techniques that they learned in that project um, in Germany now and things like that. Um, that involved, you know, yeah, injecting water into the granite um, in an unfractured granite, and then recovering the heat of that granite. Whereas now um, the deep geothermal project, for example, it drilled two and a half kilometer borehole and a five and a half kilometer borehole, like on top of each other, um, connected by uh, a permeable fault. So that permeable fault creates natural permeability between the two boreholes that they drilled. So what they're able to do is pump from the um, deeper hole, generate geothermal energy from that deep water they're getting and then they can put it back down the shallower hole and it creates a circular um, you know, system where it'll heat up as it percolates back down and then um, get that heat again. So, yeah, the modern geothermal energy is now looking at 
using existing permeability in the rock rather than having to fracture the rock themselves, which is more reliable if you can find the right structures to drill. How does the how does the hard rock mining element work then? Is that traditional crushing, grinding, and liberation, or is that for our lithium, a hard rock lithium project? Yeah. yeah. So that will be yeah, that's more traditional um, hard rock mining. It's you know, it's in the China clay pits in Cornwall, so th that's currently mining for kaolin at the moment. Um, so we can use the waste um, that they don't need because obviously they're only interested in the kaolin so it's already mined product in some cases and we can just concentrate the lithium from that but also we may look to um, mine the en enriched parts of it as well but we're trying to develop um, the most efficient way to, to liberate the lithium from the, the granite as we can um, so obviously we're trying to be as green and environmental as possible so. Okay, thank you oh, There's a question from uh, Ryan uh, can you envisage lithium production possible in the next five to 10 years in the UK, allowing us to be the first to supply in Europe? Um, you mentioned when's the, the sort of trial plant was within 12 to 18 months? Yeah, it? so like five to 10 years in the UK, I can see that definitely being a possibility. Cornish Lithium are looking 12 to 18 months to produce a pilot plant on the deep geothermal site, simultaneously doing other test work on the shallow waters. And we're also looking at processing the lithium hard rock as well. So progress, progressing on a three-pronged attack, basically. Um, you know, next stages after that is to do pre-feasibility studies and get the capital to actually build a full processing plant, which is, you know, another scale of investment, hundreds of millions rather than, you know, five to 10 million. So mm -hmm. it will depend on investment and... Hopefully we can do it in the next five to 10 years because like I said, electric vehicles, the aim for the UK government is by 2030, which is nine years away. <laughs> so we need to hope that we can get some demand or some supply by then. Mm. Okay. Um, and one from Colin, uh, are there any issues linked with wastewaters to natural radioact radioactivity and radon in particular? I guess some of that's linked to some of the issues around fracking, I guess, which is... Oh, quite the same as what we're doing here but yeah so yeah we're not doing any natural fracturing which is um not any stimulating stimulation or fracturing everything's natural permeability with regards to radioactivity and radon obviously granite produces radioactivity naturally and radon itself um, but the waters that we um pumped uh we did we tested all of the elements within them and the radon there wasn't any anything radioactive in the waters themselves at all, really, in high concentrations. Um, and getting rid of the wastewater, um, currently we've always, you know, when we've done our test work, we've stored it in bladder tanks at surface, and then we've um, discharged those in a local tailings dam. However, in the future, we will uh, liaise with the EA and relevant stakeholders of how to what the chemistry is, what of the wastewater, and how we can best discharge that, either back into the ground or through other means that we will find out then. But um, yeah, the, the waters are pretty; they're not they're not aggressive at all. There, you know, it's essentially just salty water with, with enriched lithium, so nothing too hazardous within them at all. Thank you. Uh, one from Andrew: Any problems with the planners in relation to exploration at the surface? Um, no, everything's been really good. So with um, planning the boreholes, for example, we have to do that through the um, through planning application. Uh, the benefit of Cornwall is it's got a massive mining heritage and everyone kind of understands mining and it's, it's part of their you know, blood and <laughs> almost and their heritage. So everyone's kind of quite pro it, but we, we're aware that, you know, we've got, uh, we need to, Tread carefully, make sure everyone understands what we're doing. Everyone's aware of, you know, our presence and everything like that. So, for example, United Downs, we contacted all the landowners and the uh, parish councils and everything beforehand, so they all knew what was happening. And everyone actually was really excited. Um, people would, you know, try coming on site and asking to have a look and see like that. So, everyone's very interested, and so we've had no issues at all um, with planners or the community. It's been really good. 
Excellent. That's good to hear. Okay. Um, that appears to be it on the uh, on the chat list. Um, so unless anybody has got anything else, we'll um, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Adam. And um, no problem. Yeah, look, forward, look forward to um, to hearing more about uh, Cornish lithium success. Yeah, hopefully we can, uh, you know, become something bringing the supply to the UK. So, yeah, Excellent. that's the aim. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you very much.